This is the Conquer Worry Podcast, and my name is Jay Coulter. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and advocate for those who struggle with stress or their mental health. This is your podcast home for inspirational stories and interviews with people who are making a difference in the lives of others. This episode is sponsored by Jay's new book, predictably called Conquer Worry, how to build a simple daily system to reduce stress. Visit conquerworry.com or jcoulter.com for more details. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Conquer Worry podcast. On this episode, we are going to share an inspirational story. The goal of this story is to provide hope to anyone who's found themselves with a life-threatening cancer diagnosis, and specifically, a pancreatic cancer diagnosis. This is the story about beating the odds and surviving cancer. Joining me is pancreatic cancer survivor, Ann Schaefer, and thanks for coming on the podcast. You're welcome, Jay. I'm happy to be here. Now, I'm sure that if you have downloaded this episode, you are probably familiar with some of the statistics around pancreatic cancer. You know, for, I'm taking these from the website pancreatic.org, which is a great resource. Pancreatic cancer is the third leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States. Pancreatic cancer also has the highest mortality rate of all the major cancers, and the average life expectancy after diagnosis with a metastatic disease is just three to six months. So if you're listening, I know that you're scared for yourself or someone that you love, and that is why... Anne has agreed to come on this podcast and tell her story. So, Anne, before we begin, let's go and learn a little bit about you before you got sick. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your family and what you did for a living. Okay. Um, well, I've been married for 36 years to Jeff, and we have three great children, uh, one daughter-in-law, and four of the best grandchildren in the world. Uh, we're a very close family, and basically our life revolves around family activities. I was a special ed teacher for 31 years, 25 of those years at our neighborhood elementary school. So my children grew up in the school, and the school has been a very, very much a center of life for us. So the last thing I was expecting in August of 2015 was to retire due to pancreatic cancer. Uh, On um, July 29th, 2015, I was preparing my classroom for a new school year. I was going to be out of school for a few weeks in the fall due to a knee replacement surgery that was scheduled for August 5th. I hadn't been feeling well, but just thought, Oh, it, this is because of my knees, and I was having difficulty walking. So it was something very unexpected to come up. Mm-hmm. And did you have a family history of cancer? No, we had no family history at all, and uh, that's why it was even more surprising. It was very unexpected. Um, I became very jaundiced and uh, immediately went to the doctor, who immediately scheduled a CT scan the next day. Uh, At that time, my bilirubin was about 19 and rising, and I was sent to a gastrointestinal doctor. Um, That very day, the doctor operated and placed a stent in my bile duct to do a biopsy. After that procedure, which was Two days after I was jaundiced, the doctor told my family that I had pancreatic cancer. So in the course of three days, I went from preparing for knee replacement to having pancreatic cancer. Wow. Let, let's stop, stop for a second there. and Let's go back to that very moment in time. Because my guess is some folks that are listening to your story right now, they might be in that very place. What was going through okay. your head at that time? Well, um, I was very scared, I was shocked, and I was 
very upset that I wasn't going to be able to have my knee replaced <laughs> because I wanted to end that pain. But I was so I was also so sick that I wasn't processing things normally. I didn't really process the whole illness or what was going what I was having to go through until really midway through chemo. And um so in the beginning I was I think just going from one doctor's appointment to another, just getting through the process. Was there a because sense of I, being shell shocked at all? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Because a week after my initial diagnosis, um, I had another diagnostic procedure, which um, caused pancreatitis. So I was very sick with that and in the hospital with pancreatitis for six days. So we began the the journey with a flourish, and it was really not until after the pancreatitis that we even spoke to an oncologist. And how we long had was just, that? Um, it was probably about three weeks. Three weeks. So is that when you first started to realize that there was pancreatic cancer in there, or did you know that during the initial, right after the initial biopsy? We knew that right away, okay. right after the initial biopsy. But in making one doctor's appointment and one diagnostic test after another, uh, I was basically just getting through each day. I'm sure. And then when I got pancreatitis, that took, that was uh, very severe, and even when I got out of the hospital, I was still very sick for a, probably about 10 more days. So um, then we got to the point of, okay, now we've got to see what we can do about this pancreatic cancer. So for somebody that's in that spot where they're just, so they get through the initial shell shock. And mm -hmm. they're trying to come up with a care plan, a treatment plan. They also have to go through the process of determining who they're going to tell. Is there yes. any recommendation you have, having been through that process, that you could give to somebody who's going through the decision process of whether A, to tell people at all, and B, who to tell? Actually, for me, it was not a decision whether or not to tell. I did not have a problem sharing that information. Um, the, our family grapevine works quickly, as does the community grapevine. Um, I, w I was not hesitant at all to tell people, and I think that it's important to share what you're going through because you need support. You need the support of your, your family, your friends, and your employer and your work community as well. Okay. So clearly your advice is tell everybody because you need the support to get through this. Yes, yes. Now, was it difficult to talk about? I wouldn't say that it was difficult to talk about, but you do get tired of constantly talking about cancer. Uh, that, you know, there are other things to be discussed. So my son set up a Caring Bridge site to keep family and friends informed, and that was a very valuable tool to keep all communication open, yet my husband, children, and I didn't have to constantly tell the same story. And people were very respectful about uh, not popping in to our home or calling. Mm -hmm. People were very respectful of that of our privacy. Uh, and, you know, people want to help and want to know what they can do. So Caring Bridge is a great resource okay. to help you in that realm. So to be clear, if somebody you know is going through this process right now, calling every day, showing up unannounced isn't very helpful, but showing support through resources like Caring Bridge, where the patient can then see that they were paying them some attention would is, is the better process for the patient. It really is. It really is. Uh, send a card. Uh, I had a close friend who set up a process called Meal Train where people could sign up online to bring us a meal, mm -hmm. and that was great. People would bring a meal and put it in a cooler outside our door. So 
that was another great resource for people showing their care and concern, yet um, we didn't have to constantly be entertaining people. Sounds like you had a great support network through this process. And I really did. A lot of great resources. Now, in hindsight, is there anything else that would have helped you through that that maybe your network just didn't think of? Um, I really, I honestly cannot think of anything. Uh, I had friends that did shopping for me. Wow. Uh, I, if I needed anything I needed, I could. I had somebody I could call on. I'm, I'm very lucky that I have a, a great support system here. Excellent. All right. So, so far we know that if you've just been diagnosed, it's best to tell as many people as you can to get the support network. Part of the support network, you want to make sure that you have the resources to communicate so you're not always disturbing the patient as they go through their journey through the cancer process. And the caretakers. And the caretakers. <laughs> the, or caregivers. They uh, have a very large task as well. And so all of these things are helpful for the whole family. Okay, great. Now, as part of your treatment program, you were eligible for the Whipple procedure. Yes, I was. So for people who were you know, just diagnosed, they're just maybe becoming familiar with the option of going through the Whipple procedure, could you just at a general high level tell a little bit about it? Okay. The, um, the Whipple is a very serious operation. It is uh, the removal of a section of the stomach, all of the gallbladder, and the duodenum the head of the pancreas, and the bile duct. Your digestive system is basically rerouted, and your whole body system has to adjust to this change. From the beginning, my oncologist told us that the Whipple was the only possibility for a cure of pancreatic cancer. I was anxious about having the Whipple, but I was lucky that I was a candidate for the Whipple because all people are not. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to having the Whipple, I had to have chemotherapy and radiation. So I began my treatment plan the end of August, but I didn't have the Whipple until February 3rd. Okay. So the goal was to get to the Whipple. To get to the Whipple. That's correct. Okay. Now, um, initially, I was... Um, with a different medical practice, and they wanted to do the Whipple first and then do chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, we were concerned about that because of the seriousness of the Whipple procedure and the time that it takes to recover from that. So I would have had the Whipple and then chemo and radiation. When we went to our second medical team, that's when we came up with this plan we felt comfortable with. And that is one thing that I would advise people, get a second opinion. Don't be afraid to get a second opinion. And don't feel like you're going to offend someone who, you know, has presented a, a procedure or a plan for your treatment if you don't feel comfortable with it. Always get a second opinion. That's great advice. That's great advice for whatever you're going through in life. But something as serious as this, when your mind is overwhelmed by the stress and anxiety of the situation, I imagine it's easy to get lost in the dogma of a doctor ha having all the answers. And what you're saying is don't, don't use that uh, as some type of bellwether. Make sure you get multiple opinions. Right, right. That's so that's very important. Um, another very important part of your treatment plan is to keep a medical journal. Um, we kept a journal of every doctor visit, every treatment, doctor's directions and medications. We kept a running list of questions to ask our doctors. Um, I usually had someone with me at every doctor appointment to record what was discussed. Uh, Jeff kept a running list of medications, and at one point we were tracking about 30 medications that I was on off and on. Wow. 
Uh, we set up a filing system to keep track of paperwork, billing, and insurance, and information about pancreatic cancer. Um, another helpful tip is to ask your medical insurance company for a caseworker. Um, I had a caseworker assigned to me immediately by our insurance company due to uh, the pancreatic cancer status, and she has helped resolve several billing issues with the hospital and other providers. So it, it really, it, it, to stay organized and keep on top of all information is very important. And it may not be something the patient can do herself or himself, uh, you know, it takes a village mm -hmm. to, to get through this. That's a great idea. Uh, what does that filing system look like? It's just a notebook with uh, different files in it, and I have every doctor I see, I have information about those doctors and what they're going to do or about the chemo medications I took, okay. uh, radiation, everything. Is it portable so you can take it to your meetings or do you leave it at the Yes. House? it's in. No, it's in a notebook. Okay. Typically, we just took our medical journal okay. to doctor's appointments. Okay. That's great advice. But on a personal level, um, I began writing down the blessings of cancer. And this is something that became very helpful to me because I was starting to to feel depressed and anxious a lot about what I was going through and was everything going to work out okay. And so my sister suggested that I make a list of things that I could do while I was sick with cancer. So I did that. And that led me to thinking, well, there's a lot of good things that are coming of this. And that's sometimes a hard thing to look at, but it was a great help to me to see those rays of sunshine, that the good things that were happening. Absolutely. For example, um, Jeff, my husband, was the ultimate advocate and caregiver doing research, calling doctors, taking care of me. We had that in sickness and in health, part of your marriage vow, tested and upheld. Um, another blessing was my medical team, the doctors, the nurses, the technicians. Uh, my family was a tremendous blessing. My friends and my faith was uh, definitely deepened through all this. I had the best surgeon in the world do my Whipple surgery. When he came out and spoke to the family after the surgery, he said that I had the best day possible, which is great news to hear uh, after such serious surgery. So I would recommend that people try to find some positive things because your mental health is just as important as your body in getting through this because it it is a journey and it is um very so very difficult at times when you feel bad to see anything good that's very powerful and you know one of the things that we teach at conquer worry is to build a, a daily system if you're struggling with extreme stress or your mental health and one of the things we suggest people add is a uh, journaling and looking for the positive things each day, exactly what you did. And there's mm -hmm. some science behind this. When you're out uh, proactively looking for positive things, your mind starts actively looking for positive things on, in your subconscious. So I can imagine that was very helpful. And that's great, very pragmatic of you to do that. Well, it helped a lot. And it especially helped in the long recovery period after the Whipple. Um, to avoid being overwhelmed with pancreatic cancer treatment, I tried to take each part of treatment as it came, meaning when I was in chemo, I knew all about the chemo. When I was in radiation, I knew all about the radiation. And I kind of tiptoed into learning about the Whipple because that was the part I was most scared about. 
but um, there's not a lot of information about a Whipple past the technical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. So um, the post-Whipple period was a difficult time on physical and psychological levels, so it was very helpful to have those other systems in place that we already had. And um, however difficult the Whipple was, now that I'm four minutes, four months past surgery, I can say to people, yes, you know, the surgeons who performed the Whipple saved my life, and I would recommend it. You can do it. You can get through it. Have it. If you're a candidate, have the Whipple because it will definitely save your life. So I think I heard you say, I just want to clarify, that you were able to compartmentalize each stage of your recovery process. Did I hear that? That's correct, because I, without doing that, if I started thinking about the whole treatment plan, I was completely overwhelmed. That's great advice. So we just took one part at a time. That's great advice. All right, so you know, we've talked about how this can be mentally overwhelming on many levels. And I yeah. imagine the roller coaster you went through emotionally was, was very dramatic. At first you were very sick, so maybe it was more of in the moment. But when you had those moments where maybe the pain was not as intense, the emotional pain, I imagine, was easier to recognize. What is your advice for somebody that is going through that emotional roller coaster besides the compartmentalizing and the positivity journal? Do you have any other thoughts for them? Um, yeah, it is just so important to try to find those things that you can still do and enjoy, whether it's reading a book, watching a movie, playing an instrument, uh, talking with a friend. I had uh, I have a couple of very close friends who I could call in tears and they would be right over. And we could sit and cry and talk about how terrible it was and then move on. So it's just so important that you can identify the things that will help you. And until you know those things, it's just trial and error to see what will help you. Some people don't like to uh, share with other people uh, on every level, but I was very blessed to have people that I could do that with. So, Ann, as we, uh, as we wrap this up, and just as really a thought exercise, because you've been through so much, you have beaten the odds, you've been on the roller coaster, what would you have done differently throughout the process that might help somebody listening to this recording today that's just about to start the journey? Oh, I don't know that I could say anything more except focus on the positives and believe that you will be the one patient who will be different. Um, for me, it meant that I was diagnosed in time to be treated and I was able to have a successful treatment plan. Um, do your research for the best treatment team in your area and always ask questions. Um, try to see if you can become involved with a cancer center that has an integrative approach to cancer treatment. Um, my cancer center treats the whole person. They have an integrated survivorship program, and it provides everything from the oncologist, surgeon, and radiologist to a nutritionist, uh, acupuncture, yoga, art therapy, music therapy. Uh, right now I'm in a 12-week uh, cancer rehab exercise program. So uh, I have learned so much about what our community has. I've just learned it along the way, and I'm amazed every day to know how much is out there. You just have to look for it. 
That's great. And um, my oncologist said when I first met him that survivorship begins with your first appointment with your oncologist, and it continues beyond treatment. He said that out on the day that he told me I was in complete remission and cancer-free, he said, we'll grow old together, <laughs> and I'll be a part of this program for the rest of my life. I'm a survivor, and I have hundreds of people to thank for that. And you are a survivor. You know, listeners, I, I had a chance to visit with Ann last month when I co-hosted a mental health event that Ann's daughter, Rebecca Schaefer, produced for the This Is My Brave organization. And when I first saw Ann that night, she walked up carrying a fairly heavy box of food for the volunteers that had shown up. She mingled with audience members, and she worked as a volunteer, helping out with various tasks. And, oh, before the event, she went to the gym. And you truly are an inspiration, and I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. It's my pleasure, Jay. This episode is sponsored by ConquerWorry.org. Please visit ConquerWorry.org and join our growing community.